talk about all of, we'll talk all about the cell. And with the cell, there's different ways you can sort of focus on this. We can um, talk about how scientists and clinicians study cells. Okay. We can talk about the general structure of a cell, like a prototypical cell. Um, we'll talk about the structures and functions of the plasma membrane, what you find in the cytoplasm of a typical cell, what the nucleus does, and then we'll talk about a, the life cycle of a cell as well as aging of cells. So it's a good, just sort of nice general review of cells. Um, now cytology is the word we use to describe the study of cells, and really most cells are only visible underneath a microscope. Most of the human body cells are in the order of 10 micrometers, which is one one hundredth of a millimeter wide. So think about a millimeter, which is about the, the, uh, the width of a really thick hair, would be about a millimeter. A thick hair, though, not a thin one. And one one hundredth of that, so one percent of that diameter, is about the diameter of an average human cell, which is much smaller than what an eye can see. So you can't really see cell. You can't see an individual cell, but when you look at a tissue, like skin, there's a lot of cells you're seeing at once, right? Now, um, some cells can be as small as like seven micrometers, like a red blood cell. Others can be fairly large, like oocytes, which is the female egg. That can be as large as 120 micrometers, which is one-tenth of a millimeter, and you can see that with an unaided eye. Like if you can somehow isolate an oocyte or a hum uh, female egg, you can see that without a microscope. It's large enough to see. Like 100 micrometers is about the, the um, width of a very thin hair. So, and that's the largest cell in your body. So, kind of interesting. Uh, the shapes of cells can vary from flat, cylindrical, oval, or irregular. Not all cells are circular, right? Like if I ask you guys to draw a cell, you'd probably draw a circle, right? But not all cells are shaped that way. Many cells have lots of different interesting shapes, which also relate to their function. So what this is showing you guys is just the scale of being. Um, we can talk about atoms you know, at the atomic letter, level. That's in the order of nanometers, which is millionths of a meter. Um, you know, or otherwise, we could talk about the, the uh, cell diameter, which is in the micrometers. That's thousands of a, of a meter. Um, otherwise, you know, once we talk, talk about human size, that's in the order of meters. right? So a meter is about three feet or so. So cells are in the thousandths of a meter in diameter. They're very small. Um, which requires a microscope to see them. Now, there's three main types of, of microscopes that scientists use to develop or to study cells. The first is a light microscope. Now, light microscopes are the ones you guys are probably familiar with and you've used before. Uh, those are the ones where you actually have visible light that passes through your specimen, and then you then you capture the light in like binoculars and and look at it that way. That's a light microscope. Now, light microscopes are good for seeing cells, but they're not. Uh, their resolution isn't good enough to see, you know, mo individual molecules or atoms. You know, that doesn't work. Uh, otherwise, if you use um, electron microscopy, this is a type of microscope where you actually don't use visible light. You use beams of electrons, which are basically just electrically charged particles. And those beams of electrons can get really, really high definition uh, pictures. So if you guys ever seen like a, a, a picture of like a, um, a dust mite, you know, and it looks like, looks all gnarly, and it's you know kind of grayish. That's an electron microscope picture, okay? And those can get really good resolution. But the only way those work though is if you coat the specimen in gold. So they're expensive. Like you have to spray whatever you're studying in gold. And then what happens is the gold reflects those electrons. That's how you can see them. Uh, otherwise, too small. The electrons can just pass right through. So it's kind of interesting. There's two main two main types of electron microscopes. We have transmission and scan electron microscopes. Uh, a transmission electron microscope can actually pass through the specimen, okay? So if you want to look inside of a cell, you can use a TEM, or transmission electron microscope. Like let's say if you wanted to see the nucleus of a cell, you can actually pass electrons through the cell into the inside and then study the internal anatomy of that cell, okay? Otherwise, a scanning electron microscope just gets the outer surface of cells or other objects, okay? So what does this look like? Well, it turns out, you guys, that with these three pictures, we're looking at the same thing, but using different microscopes. So on the left here, what we're looking at is basically some tissue underneath a light microscope. This is the kind of microscope we'll be using in lab and also looking at pictures of in class. And this is what um, you know is most available and kind of not as expensive, if that makes sense. 
Uh, these electron microscopes are in the orders of like millions of dollars, and the only universities that have them are like you know the the top universities that can afford them. You know who has money to drop like on a three million dollar microscope? Well, <laughs> Harvard and Yale and like those kinds of places. Actually, CU has an electron microscope too. It's kind of cool. Um, so these are little things called cilia, and the function of cilia is they wave. They kind of wave in a certain motion. And you find cilia throughout your body, and especially the respiratory tract, to like help remove debris from your lungs. But what's cool though is that this is the same thing. These are cilia, but using a transmission electron microscope. So you're actually looking at the internal anatomy of these cilia up close. So you can see that with electron microscope, you can get much better resolution. And with a TEM, you can actually get to see into that structure. You're seeing through the membrane of that structure. This one's showing a scanning electron microscope picture of the same cilia, but you're, now you're getting the outer surface of those structures. If you look at it, it kind of looks like shaggy hair, right? And in fact, uh, like cilia is derived from the word shaggy hair. And, and you can see these things have, they look like little arms or something dangling. Now, in live cells, these cilia actually will wave in a specific direction. And by waving, they can move debris across their surface. And so you can use different cell, uh, types of microscopes to study the anatomy of structures, right? I mean, let's say if you didn't have a scanning electron microscope, this is all you would know about cilia, which doesn't really look that impressive, right? I mean, it's still, you can still see they look like little extensions or hairs, and it's possible they might move or something. But until you really get these electron microscopes, you can't really um, see their internal anatomy or their uh, really precise anatomy here. And by the way, you guys, this is 3,300 times normal human vision. So if you can take your normal human vision, whatever you can see up close, at, its, at, at the most, you know, the closest to your eye, this is 3,300 times that resolution, which is pretty phenomenal. Like it's hard to even fathom what that means, but it's pretty cool. I wish I had an electron microscope. <laughs> like, what would you guys look at? If you had an electron microscope available to you, what would you want to look at up close? There's a lot. A cell? A cell? Yeah, just like some sort of cell. Maybe like a cheek cell or something. Um, I know that on eyelashes, there's these little, these little um, types of, uh, not really an insect, but it's a, it's a type of uh, organism that, kind of feeds on the oil secretions. And uh, you can see that really well with an electron microscope. So you can actually just kind of like brush your eyelashes onto a slide and look at a microscope. You can see the little organisms that wiggle around in your eyelashes. Now they're so small, you, you're not aware of them, right? But like I said, there's a whole universe even within us and on us. Like there's actually more bacteria inside your body than there are cells of your own body. That blows my mind. How does that work? Well, bacterial cells are small. Like, our cells are much larger than bacterial cells, but by number, there are more bacterial cells in the human body than, cell, than your own cells, which means you're mostly bacterial cells, by the way. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> so what are some of the functions of cells? We know that cells are involved with uh, coverings and linings. We know that cells can store different things. Do you guys know anything, anything that cells can store for us? Yeah, they can store water, they can store sugars like carbohydrates, they can store fat, lipids, okay? Chromosomes. Yes, cells also store genetic material, chromosomes. Uh, cells are also involved in movement. You know, some cells are actually capable of moving around in different mechanisms. Uh, some cells are involved with connecting to each other or, or defense. So, like, immune cells are involved in defense for your body. Some cells are involved with communication. Like, this is how your brain works. You know, you have 100... 100 uh, 100 billion neurons in your brain, and all of those are highly interconnected, and so that's how you think and hear and listen and love and want and that kind of stuff. Um, and also cells are involved with reproduction. So um, what this is showing you guys are how cells, once they're in their tissues, can have lots of different structures and orientations. So what we're looking at here, you guys, is a, is a, is a picture of skin up close underneath the microscope, and skin cells are really good at protection. Right? They can protect your body from external environment um, other, uh, or infection. Um, they're also really good at lining the outside of your body. Uh, brain cells down here, which are highly interconnected, those are involved with communication. This is showing sperm cells, which are involved with movement and reproduction. This is an example of a muscle cell here, which is involved with producing contraction and movement. Uh, we have blood cells, like a white blood cell here, which is involved with defense. So there's lots of different functions of cells. And although they all contain the same genetic material, 
they have lots of different functions based on their the types of genes they express. So a prototypical cell just means like what's a typical cell like? What does it look like? Well, there's several key parts to a typical cell. We have a plasma membrane, a cytoplasm, and the nucleus. So the plasma membrane is the outer barrier of a cell that's selectively permeable. We'll come back to what that means, but it's the outer barrier of that cell. Okay. The cytoplasm is the inner, in, the inside, excuse me, inside contents of that cell, and it's sort of like a gelatinous type of material. Okay, it includes basically protein, organelles, water, all the stuff that makes like sort of like this inner gelatin. And then the nucleus we call like the control center of a cell because it contains most of your cell's genetic material and therefore can direct the activities of uh, those cellular components. So this is showing what a prototypical cell looks like. So what's this outer purple layer called? Plasma membrane, right? So you guys know how many functions of plasma membrane? Or just do you, do you know of any functions of it? Like what does a plasma membrane do? Perfect. The plasma membrane is semi-permeable, so it allows certain things to cross, but prevents other things from crossing, right? Uh, so you might want to have nutrients enter the cell and have wastes be expelled from a cell, but maybe not other larger substances get inside your cells. You know, you don't want everything that's nearby getting into your cell. So and therefore, it's selectively permeable. So it's involved with transport. Okay. Um, what was the cytoplasm again? All this, pretty much all the stuff inside, right? When you think of the water, the protein, the organelles, all of this is cytoplasm. And it, in fact, it has sort of a gelatinous kind of consistency because it's, it's water and protein. Okay. And then what about the nucleus? What's its function? The brain, right? And so in that sense, what does it do? You got it. It's the control center because it contains most of your cell's genetic material. Now, there's a lot going on in this cell. You can see there's some green things, there's some red things, there's some brown things, and a blue thing here too, right? Well, uh, each of these are organelles, and organelles all have specific functions in a cell, right? And so, uh, in fact, organelle means little organ, right? So we have, we talk about in a human body, organs have specific functions. Well, organelles are the little organs inside of a cell that all have a specific function for that cell, right? So we'll go through the functions of organelles like mitochondria here or the Golgi apparatus or endoplasmic reticulum, peroxisomes, lysosomes. We'll talk about all of that throughout lecture today. Okay? But we're going to first start with the functions and structure of the plasma membrane. We're going to start with the more superficial aspect first, you know, the, the outer layer, the plasma membrane, and then work our way deeper. Okay. Most of this should be reviewed for you guys, though. So for the plasma membrane, it's also called the cell membrane, it's extremely thin. This thing is only about um, 100 nanometers in diameter. So uh, that's, you know, like one-tenth of a micrometer. So it's really, really thin. Um, although it's thin, it's also highly protective. You know, it's thin but strong. Okay. Now it serves as a selective barrier and it's therefore allows certain things to cross the plasma membrane, like nutrients and wastes can cross pretty easily, but other substances or microorganisms can't just cross the plasma membrane freely. Okay, therefore it's selectively permeable. So it actually will select things that can cross and prevent other things from crossing. So the plasma membrane is mostly made of lipids and protein. Uh, lipids include things like cholesterol, phospholipids, fats, oils, that kind of stuff. So those are lipids. And then proteins are basically protein. They're made of amino acids. So if the plasma membrane is mostly made of lipids and protein, um, you know, well, that's sort of what we eat. That's kind of part of what we eat. So it's kind of interesting. Um, so what does a plasma membrane look like? Well, here we see it's a lipid bilayer. So we have an outer leaflet and an inner leaflet. And it's mostly made of phospholipids that are lined up in a long chain here. Okay, so you have a phospholipid bilayer. So you have one layer of phospholipids here, another layer of phospholipids here. Now these lipids are hydrophobic, which means they're afraid of water. So what does that mean? Well, what this means is that water can't cross very easily. You know, if the plasma membrane is mostly made of lipids, and lipids are things like fats and oils and cholesterol, do those dissolve in water? Like what if you had, uh, yeah, you're going to make some pasta and you pour some olive oil in there, right? Not it's not going to mix. It's not water-soluble. So because it's not water-soluble, 
The platinum membrane then also serves as a nice protective barrier to separate the two fluid environments of your cell. So the plasma membrane can actually separate extracellular fluid from intracellular fluid because water can't freely cross this plasma membrane. The plasma membrane is hydrophobic, which means if water gets close, it's going to repel that water. Okay, So it, it repels water. Um, but embedded within the plasma membrane, you can find lots of proteins. So some of these proteins could be things like glycoproteins, which are involved with cell signaling. You can have channels that allow for certain substances to flow across the plasma membrane. Um, otherwise, you can ha have uh, these cytoskeletal elements that are associated there too. Now, the phospholipid bilayer um, has a polar and a nonpolar end. Polar end means that it has um, sort of electrically, uh, has electrical pole. It has a positive end and a negative end, if that makes sense. And polar molecules are attracted to water. But most of these phospholipids are nonpolar. These nonpolar parts to the phospholipid are the tails here. So all of these tails in the phospholipid bilayer are nonpolar and therefore hydrophobic. They're afraid of water, so they hide from water by kind of facing each other inward, and therefore they're not exposed to water. So what the plasma membrane does is it does a really good job of preventing water from crossing cell membranes, you know, what of its functions are, uh, because it's hydrophobic or nonpolar. Now, uh, basically what we have then, you guys, are these uh, polar head groups, which we saw back here. So each of these little purple circles is a polar head group, and then these nonpolar tails that kind of project inward. Um, now, there are other lipids you find in the plasma membrane. In fact, 20% of those lipids in the membrane are, is cholesterol. So cholesterol is an important part of diet and your life. You know, you hear about uh, people saying, you know, well, you shouldn't be eating too much cholesterol. That's true. You know, foods that are high in cholesterol would be like eggs, right, especially the yolk of an egg or shrimp are really high in cholesterol. You know, excessive amounts of cholesterol are associated with cardiovascular disease, but you still need a moderate amount of cholesterol to make the structure of your cell membrane. So that's important. However, your liver can make cholesterol on its own. Like you don't need dietary cholesterol. Like your liver can make it itself. It's also important for, for uh, certain hormones. Now, glycolipids make about 5 to 10% of the rest of these member, membrane lipids. And a glycolipid means a sugar lipid. So it's basically a lipid that has a sugar molecule attached. And these are involved with things like cell-to-cell -cell recognition. This is how cells can kind of um, present that they are of your own body and, you know, they're not a foreign cell. Now, uh, other membrane proteins you find in the plasma membrane, things like integral proteins or peripheral proteins. These integral pro proteins are the ones that span the entirety of your plasma membrane. The peripheral proteins are kind of off the side a little bit, and they all have different functions. So uh, integral proteins, like I said, they span the entirety of the membrane, and they're embedded in this phospholipid bilayer. Uh, they're exposed to both the inside and the outside of the cell, and we also call these transmembrane proteins. Now, they have lots of different functions, and uh, those differ from the peripheral proteins because these are not embedded in the lipid bilayer. They're more loosely attached, and they're often enzymes, so it means they're involved in chemical reactions. So what are some of the functions of these membrane proteins then? Well, proteins you find in the plasma membrane can be involved with transport, right? So what are some materials or substances you might want to transport across the plasma membrane? Yeah? Um, sodium, potassium, and other, I guess, nutrients. Good. Well. Yeah, ions like sodium and potassium. Right? Or other nutrients. Like what's a nutrient for a cell? You guys know what I mean? Yeah. Think about what you eat. What are some nutrients you eat? Yeah, carbohydrates, sugars, exactly. So carbohydrates and simple sugars can be transported across the plasma membrane. Uh, what are some other nutrients you, you eat? Yeah, fats, right? Those can be transported too. Protein, good. Um, so those can be transported across the plasma membrane. Now these plasma membrane proteins are also involved in intercellular connections, which means that they can actually help connect cells to cells. So it actually binds those cells together. Because if you think about it, like let's think about your skin, you guys. Uh, skin's a really good example. You know, in a, any given patch of skin, there's millions of cells right there, right? But why is it when you pick up on your skin that your skin doesn't just tear away? You got it. Because those cells are highly interconnected. That way it gives them as a whole a lot of structure to be all supported together. Otherwise, if you didn't have these intercellular connections, 
your body would just be mush. It would just fall apart. It would just kind of slough away, right? So you need these intercellular connections to hold many cells together. Not all your cells want to be held together, but, but many can be. Um, it's also important for cells to be anchored to what we call a cytoskeleton. Okay? Um, now, the, the cytoskeleton is like the skeleton of a cell. It turns out the plasma membrane is actually anchored to the internal cytoskeleton, which gives it some structure. Okay? Um, some of these plasma membrane proteins are also enzymes. Enzymes are basically uh, reaction catalysts, so they can speed up chemical reactions. Um, some of these are involved with cell-to-cell -cell recognition and signal transduction, which basically means they can convert one signal to another. So an example of signal transduction would be like a hormone, which is a chemical signal, could bind to a receptor, and that might activate an electrical signal inside of that cell. That would be signal transduction, where you're converting one signal to another type of signal, where it's chemical to possibly electrical. Okay? Now, we, earlier we talked about how the plasma membrane was selectively permeable, right? So it's membrane permeability is influenced by several different factors, like uh, what types of transport proteins are there, the structure of your membrane, if there's a concentration gradient, ionic charge, lipid solubility, or molecular size. We'll come back to this stuff later, and we'll do a good review of this material. Um, this relates more to like, the physiology of how your plasma membrane is involved with uh, transportation of materials. Now, there's two main types of plasma membrane transport. We have passive and active transport. Passive transport does not require ATP. Active transport does require ATP. So do you guys uh, know what ATP is? Yeah, it's a form of energy. Good. It's a form of chemical energy that's usable by the cells, right? In fact, ATP is like the chemical energy currency of a cell. Like they talk about how, you know, your mitochondria can convert molecules to ATP, and that's a usable form of energy that your cells can do for work, like to carry out certain functions. Passive transport does not require ATP. So there's no ATP required to transport some molecules across the plasma membrane of a cell. Okay? Other types of transport that do require ATP, they're called active transport. And that active transport does require ATP. So it needs the energy to move something across the cell. So for passive transport, there's four main types. We have simple diffusion, osmosis, facilitated diffusion, and filtration. Now, uh, this, your, your textbook assumes that you guys all know what diffusion is already. Okay? Now, uh, unless you've had a biology class more recently or if you remember from years ago, you probably don't already know what it is. And so let's just quickly talk about what diffusion is before we move forward. So um, diffusion is a process of nature. Right? It's a process that occurs in, in our natural world, and it's due to the fundamental properties of our universe. But diffusion is a process where molecules move from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. Right? So I'll give you an example. Let's say if you had a, a big bucket of water, and you dropped some food coloring in that water. What happens to the food coloring? It disperses. It disperses, it dissipates, and it kind of goes all throughout the container. In fact, it'll spread until the entire solution of that container contains an equal amount of all of that food coloring, right? Like you won't have the situation, well, unless it's a lipid, but you won't have a situation that the food coloring stays in one little area and doesn't spread, right? If the food coloring is water-soluble, it'll diffuse or spread throughout that container. So what's going on there? Well, when you drop the food coloring in the bucket, the area of highest concentration is right where that drop hits the water, right? But diffusion is a process where molecules move from high to low concentration. So we have more molecules right where the drop hit. They're going to spread to areas where there's less of those molecules. Okay? So I'll give you guys another example. Like let's say, um, let's say if you drop some sugar in water, what happens to the sugar? It does dissolve, right? Now, would it dissolve unequally or equally throughout the solution? Equally. Good. Like, you won't have a situation where, like, the sugar, well, it could happen, but I'm just for the purpose of this example. It won't be like the sugar only mixes with half of the water and not the other half, right? So let's think about this with respect to a cell. What about if you had more sodium outside of a cell and less sodium inside the cell? Where does sodium want to flow? In, right? It's going to go from high concentration to low concentration, okay? That's diffusion. Now, is, is anyone confused by that? Are you guys good? Everyone kind of, does that sound familiar to everyone? 
Okay. Um, so we have two main types of diffusion. We have simple diffusion and facilitated diffusion. Now, simple diffusion is going to be where you have small nonpolar molecules that can freely cross the plasma membrane. So what's the plasma membrane made of? Lipids. Phospholipids, exactly. So mostly lipids. And they're, that's, you know, includes fats. So do, do fats and water just mix? No. no. So we know then that water won't cross by simple diffusion because simple diffusion where it just flows straight across. Like if, it, if water can't mix with the plasma membrane, it's not going to cross the plasma membrane. So what does dissolve in fats? You guys know? Other fats. You, know, you can mix oils. Like you can make blends of oils and stuff. So what if you had things that are small and nonpolar, like other lipids, those can cross right across the plasma membrane. So what are some examples of other lipids? Well, cholesterol and cholesterol-derived hormones. So any of the steroid hormones like testosterone, estrogen, cholest uh, sorry, cortisol, progesterone, any of the ones are steroid hormones, and those can just freely flow across the plasma membrane because they are derived from lipids and like dissolves like. So things that are nonpolar like lipid dissolve really well with other nonpolar lipids so they can flow right across the plasma membrane. We call that simple diffusion. Okay? Other nonpolar molecules like gases, so O2 and CO2, those are nonpolar. Those can flow right across the plasma membrane. And if it's simple diffusion, it doesn't require any special transport proteins. It could just flow right through. Okay? It would be like if you could walk through a wall, right? If the wall is like your plasma membrane, there are certain substances that could just go and just walk right through that wall. No problem. No questions asked. Doesn't require any extra energy. In fact, if this is a passive type of transport, does it require ATP? No, exactly. No ATP required for simple diffusion. So we talk about like O2 or CO2, which are gases. Those can move across the plasma membrane due to simple diffusion. They can just flow right across because they're nonpolar. Okay. Now, osmosis is the diffusion of water. Um, so how does this work? Well, it's basically diffusion of water. And so when we talk about diffusion as a process, molecules from, move from an area of high concentration to low concentration until those become equal, right? If there's equal concentrations, they won't move, okay? So what about water? Well, water can flow due to diffusion too, but the diffusion of water we call osmosis. So water has a tendency to move from an area of high water concentration to low water concentration, okay? Let me go, give you guys an example. Um, an area of like low water concentration could be like a sugar cube that has just a little bit of water in it, right? But then what if you poured some water on top of that sugar cube? Well, you have an area of higher water concentration outside of the sugar cube and less water inside that sugar cube. So what's going to happen is the water is going to want to rush into the sugar cube, right? As well as the sugar molecules spreading into the water. And so osmosis is just the diffusion of water. So I'll give you guys another example. What if you had more water outside of the cell, like a higher concentration of water outside of the cell, and a lower concentration of water inside the cell? Where would water flow? In, exactly. So how do we know about water concentration? Well, another way to think about this too, guys, is that water follows solutes. And solutes are things that can dissolve in water, right? So if you have an area of high solute concentration somewhere, water will be attracted to that area of higher solute concentration. It's just another way to look at the same process. So I'll give you guys an example. Let's say if you guys are solutes, okay, you guys in the class are solutes, and I'm water, okay? And let's say there's a lot more of me, water, up here than water back there, because I'm not back there yet, right? So where do I want to flow then as water? Towards you guys, right? So if I'm water, I'll move to the area of higher solute concentration, which is you. So I'll start walking towards you, okay? That's due to osmosis. Now, uh, you can look at different pictures. of You can kind of isolate this process. Um, and it's the same process of simple, as simple diffusion. Some water can go through the plasma membrane, but most of it requires some sort of protein to go through. Like it needs to go through a, a transport protein. It has to get through the, the membrane somehow. And um, osmosis is just the diffusion of water. So, um, oh, I got a good question for you guys. You know, you hear about the people who drink too much water and you can die from that? 
You know, there was, a, there was a case some years back about like a radio station having a water drinking competition. And there was a lady who just was chugging like gallons of water. She ended up dying because she drank too much water. Well, how did that work? Like, how, how could you die from drinking too much water? Well, let's think about osmosis. If you're drinking water and there's not a lot of solutes in that water, it's like more like tap water, right? Not like the water in your body, which has a lot of salt in it. If you drink a lot of water, where's that water going to go? It's gonna, yeah, it's gonna kind of get absorbed into your body, and when you absorb that water, you're di also diluting out your body's solutions, which means you're kind of making it more dilute or less concentrated. And so, what happens in is you, you can go and do electrolyte imbalance, and that can do things like stop your heart or give you seizures. And so, just by drinking too much water, that can be fatal, which is interesting. Yeah. Does anything that passes the cell membrane by means of a protein require ATP? No, not necessarily. That's that's an excellent question. So, uh, what was your name again? I'm sorry. Ken. Ken, cool. So, Ken's question was, does anything that crosses the plasma membrane that uses a transport protein, does that require ATP? And the answer is no, but we'll, we'll come back to that. We're not, um, I think we're going to talk about it here. Nice, good segue. So, uh, facilitated diffusion is where you still get diffusion across the plasma membrane, but you need something to facilitate that process. And the facilitation here is that you need a transport protein. Basically, it's a protein tube that's stuck in the plasma membrane, and it's a nice little tube that molecules can, can flow through. Okay, That way, molecules that wouldn't otherwise cross the plasma membrane can flow through this protein tube. Now, we call that facilitated diffusion. It it's, doesn't require ATP because diffusion is a natural process. It doesn't require any additional energy input. So it's a way you can transport larger um, polar molecules so that, that can't cross the plasma membrane, they can just flow through a protein tube into or out of the cell. We call that facilitated diffusion. Now, an example of this could be water, because water is repelled by the plasma membrane. So how does a significant amount of water cross the membrane? Well, you actually have water channels. We call these aquaporins, and they are facilitated diffusion tubes that are stuck in your plasma membrane, and therefore water can move in its direction of osmosis. So let's give, I'll give you an example. What if you, um, what if you had a situation where uh, there's a lot of solutes outside of a cell and less solutes inside the cell? Which way would water want to flow then? Out of the cell towards the area of more solutes. So what would happen to your entire cell? It would shrink. It would shrivel up. Good. Awesome. Now, uh, we'll, and we'll come back to that kind of stuff later. Now, filtration is actually the process of forcing water across a membrane due to pressure, like fluid pressure. Can you guys think of any examples of like filtration in your body where you might force water across the plasma membrane due to like a fluid pressure? Someone say kidneys? Nice, good, yeah, exactly, that's in your kidneys. Your kidneys filter your blood because your blood has pressure, which means it has, it's exerting sort of you know, force along the walls of blood vessels. Well, that water is actually forced out through little tiny channels or holes in those blood vessels. And that's filtration. It's a process of basically forcing that fluid across the membrane. Now, what about the active transport? Well, they all require ATP. So if it's active transport, it does require ATP. And it's the movement of a molecule against its concentration gradient. So if you're going against the concentration gradient, what that means then is you're going from an area of low concentration to an area of high concentration. So you're going uphill. If you're going uphill, does that require energy? Absolutely, right? So you're going against the force of diffusion. Diffusion wants to go from high concentration to low concentration. It's easy to go down, right? What's more difficult then is moving a substance to an area of higher concentration, okay? And that typically requires a lot of energy input, which, we, which means you need ATP. So you might wonder, when, when would a cell want to do that? Well, what if your cell was really full of sugar? but you still wanted to absorb more sugar. Well, then you might need ATP to pump more sugar into your cell, even though the concentration is higher inside the cell. So it re requires additional energy input. Okay? Um, or you can transport different ions. So there's a sodium-potassium pump that every single cell in your body has, and the sodium-potassium pump basically uses ATP to pump sodium and potassium in different directions. Um, so what this slide has shown you guys is that, is that sodium-potassium pump. Now, it's basically a type of protein transporter you find in the plasma membrane. It uses ATP to 
physically pump sodium out of a cell and potassium into a cell. If these things are always working, what's going to happen to the sodium inside your cell if you're always pumping it out? Inside the cell. Yeah, it's going to deplete. You're going to find a lot less sodium inside your cell versus out. And then what about if these, if these pumps are always working and they're pumping potassium into your cell, what does that mean for the concentration of potassium inside? Higher. It's higher in. Good. So potassium is going to be in higher concentration inside of a cell. Sodium is going to be in higher concentration outside that cell due to this sodium-potassium pump. You might wonder why. What's the point? Well, we'll come back to this later when we talk about action potentials, which are nerve impulses, and those are used for cell-to-cell -cell communication. And it's important for this concentration gradient to be established. Like you want sodium to be in higher concentration outside of the cell, and you want sodium to be in higher concentration inside the or, I'm sorry, potassium to be in higher concentration inside the cell in order for you to communicate around your body. And we'll but we'll come back to that. Okay. But that requires ATP. Now bulk transport refers to the movement of materials in vesicles. Do you guys know what a vesicle is? A little spaceship. sphere. It's a little spaceship kind of sphere looking thing. What's that what's that sphere made of? You guys know? You do actually you could find a little bit of material inside the vesicle, but what about the, the outer layer of that vesicle? Do you guys know what it's made of? If you had to guess, what would you guess? It's not a it is. It is? Yeah. It's made of a phospholipid bilayer. So a vesicle is like a tiny cell inside of your cells. But it's unlike a cell because the inside of that vesicle doesn't contain organelles or anything. It just contains materials. Like it might be things you want to bring into the cell or things you might want to get out of that cell. Okay? They like move around. They're like little cars inside of your cell. You got it. Yeah, they're like little cars inside your cell. And they, they get transported that way. In fact, what's interesting is these things attach to proteins that physically walk around your cell. <laughs> they, they transport that way. So it's kind of like a, it's kind of like a car in that regard. Um, so exo means out of, like an exoskeleton. You know, there's some animals that have exoskeletons. You know, insects have exoskeletons, crustaceans, that kind of stuff. Um, uh, endocytosis, endo means within. So exocytosis means the transportation of materials out of a cell. So what are some things your cells might want to get out, like to expel? You might want to dump out of a cell. Wastes, good. That's exact. I mean, that's that's a perfect example. What's that? Uh, maybe CO2, but remember, carbon dioxide can freely cross the plasma membrane, so you don't you don't need that process. What about uh, hormones? That's how they get inside of cells. What about like neurotransmitters, or how your brain cells communicate? Right? They need to expel those molecules out of the cell, and that way they can kind of go on and touch the next cell to send that signal along. So that's called exocytosis. And endocytosis is the reverse process. We're actually bringing things into the cell. Okay? Can you guys think of anything that you might want to bring into the cell? Sugars. sugars. Yeah, large sugars you might want to bring in. Um, somebody else said something? I couldn't hear. I just heard mumble. You might want to bring into the cell. Other nutrients, like you know, sugars, large proteins. What about bacteria? Why might you want to bring a bacterium into your cell? Not, uh, that's a good guess, but not, yeah. You're right, there are good bacteria, but not for that reason. <laughs> we'll come back to that, though. Yeah, because there, there are good bacteria that help keep us alive and they make us vitamins, but you don't necessarily want to bring them into your cell. In fact, the type of endocytosis we want to bring like a bacteria in is called phagocytosis, which means to eat. And it's basically where your cells can engulf a bacterium, bring it in, and then degrade it. They can break it down once it's inside the cell, which is pretty gnarly. Like what, like a white blood cell? Yeah, like a white blood cell could do that. Exactly. Good. So exocytosis means to transport substances out of a cell using a vesicle. Endocytosis means to bring substances into the cell using a vesicle. And so what does this look like? Well, on this slide, what we see then in green is our vesicle, right? So the vesicle is a small little uh, sphere of lipid bilayer here. On the inside of that, we have a watery solution. So these could be like neurotransmitters or something. So this is showing exocytosis. So what if you had some neurotransmitter or hormone that you wanted to get out of the cell to communicate with another one? Well, what we can do is it package that into a vesicle. 
This vesicle then can fuse with the plasma membrane because they're both made of phospholipid bilayer. The vesicle actually becomes part of the membrane, and that means that the inside of this vesicle then is now on the outside of the cell. That's one way you can kind of expel those contents out. Okay. So you might wonder, well, what happens to all these this little extra pocket of, of uh, phospholipid bilayer if it's, it's, all, it's fusing with your plasma membrane? Like, what if you expelled a lot of vesicles at once? You're basically just putting more phospholipid bilayer up into your cell, right? Well, there's actually, up nearby, there's little places you can clip off the excess. It, like, cuts away the excess membrane. It's kind of cool. And then what about endocytosis, you guys? What, what's that process? Bringing something in, right? So what if I told you guys that this is showing both exocytosis and endocytosis? So if you go top down, that's showing exocytosis because you're actually expelling something out of the cell. But what if you go bottom up? You guys see how that could work? Now you're bringing something in. Ah. Now, is this active or passive transport? Active. active, yeah. It requires a tremendous amount of ATP because it takes a lot of energy to do that. Good. All right, cool. Now, uh, one example of endocytosis here is phagocytosis, where you might want to bring in like some extracellular debris, bacteria, any kind of wastes you might want to bring into the cell to break down that material. That way you can remove it from your body. So I'll give you guys an example. Like uh, with stroke, and once you lose blood flow to a specific patch of your brain, that brain tissue die, dies, right? But what happens to those dead cells in your brain? Do they stay there forever? No, it's broken down. But how does your body remove all that, that dead tissue? Phagocytosis. So what happens is immune cells will come in and take little bits of that dead tissue, engulf it, bring it into the cell, and then chop it up into small pieces, and then those pieces are reincorporated back, back into your body. It's kind of weird. So you actually just recycle that, that material. So although it was once dead tissue, other cells can engulf it, break it apart, and then it gets transported throughout your body, like in blood, where other cells can use that. Again. It's kind of interesting. That's phagocytosis. We also have pinocytosis. Do you guys know what pinot means? It's water. So pinocytosis is where cells can take big gulps of water. Okay? And it's just an example of endocytosis, but it's endocytosis of water. Okay? Cool. And then there's also another one here, you guys, called receptor-mediated endocytosis. And this is where a cell can actually bring something in once it binds to a receptor. So let's say if a substance binds to a receptor, that can actually stimulate endocytosis of that substance. Yeah? So to be clear, any of these like cytoses that are happening, those all require ATP? Exactly. They all do. Because it takes a lot of energy to either bring a vesicle in and basically, this vesicle, you guys, is just made of plasma membrane. You're basically talking about taking the outer layer of the cell, bringing it close, in, close enough together to where you can pinch those ends and then have a vesicle come in. Okay. Yeah. And that requires a lot of energy. Um, and the same for the reverse process. Uh, it, won't, it won't occur without ATP because it just takes way too yeah. much energy. Yeah. That's a great question. Plasm is really just all of the internal material of the cell. And it's kind of a gelatinous protein-like substance. Okay. Now, cytoplasm includes three specific components, cytosol, inclusions, and organelles. Cytosol is like the watery portion <laughs> of the cytoplasm. Inclusions could be like proteins, other wastes, things that can accumulate inside the cell. And then the organelles, remember, like, were the little organs of the cell. We'll talk about the functions of those organelles coming up soon. So cytosol is, like I said, is sort of the watery, viscous, syrupy-like substance of the cytoplasm. And it's mostly made of water with things that are dissolved within it. So like ions, nutrients, proteins, carbohydrates, lipids, other small molecules. Think of this as almost like a nutrient shake. You know what I mean? You can go, go, to, the, go to like Whole Foods, maybe buy like a, like a nutrient shake. It's going to have all these things in it. It's going to have ions, proteins, carbohydrates, lipids, right? Um, things your body needs. Now, they might not be in really high concentration, but they're in high enough concentration to make this less watery and more viscous, kind of syrupy. So if you could somehow isolate a lot of cytosol and pour it out of a glass, it would pour like a syrupy kind of solution because it's thick with these particular substances. Okay, And it makes sense. Like We don't have pure water in our cells. Um, now, other inclusions you might find within these cells uh, could be like proteins or different wastes. Sometimes it could be things like melanin. Now, we'll come back to this later in skin, but melanin 
is a, is a pigmented molecule you can find in certain types of cells, like skin cells or cells of your iris, and they, they help determine skin color. Now, other things you can find inside of cells, too, could be uh, nutrients like glycogen. Glycogen is a long chain of sugars, so it's a carbohydrate, and it's a way that your cells can sh store sugar for later use. You know, we all have heard of, like, fat before and how our bodies can store fat. What's less talked about, though, is glycogen. And there's only certain cells that store this, like your liver does, skeletal muscle cells store it, and your heart muscle stores it as well. But glycogen is a way for your body to store sugar for later use. You got about a day's worth of supply of glycogen. If you, let's say if you didn't eat for a full day, you, you, run out, you could run out of glycogen in that day. And then beyond that, you have to, you'd have to rely on other types of nutrients, if that makes sense. But if you guys have heard of people with carbo loading before like a big race, race, you know, what they're trying to do then is basically ingest as much carbohydrates or sugars before they go on their race because it's gonna, that means their, their cells can store it in the form of glycogen, then they have more energy to run farther, right? Like if you're gonna do one of those ultra marathons, where you run 100 miles up at Leadville or something, <laughs> something crazy like that, which I'm just, those are, that's just impressive. My body couldn't take it, but I'm, I'm impressed that some people can. Uh, so other part of, uh, of the cytoplasm, you guys, are the organelles. So organelles, like I said, mean little organs. Each of these performs a specific function for the cell. So we have a, we have a specific division of labor. So what this means is you have certain organelles that don't do one thing, other organelles that do another, but together they support the, all the entire function of that cell. So uh, the type and number of organelles can vary from cell to cell. I'll give you guys an example. Red blood cells, you know, it's a cell, but they pretty much lack all organelles. There's really not many organelles inside of a red blood cell. Now if you compare that to uh, a liver cell, Liver cells have a lot of mitochondria, and they have a lot of another organelle called endoplasmic reticulum. Okay, and that, that's, that's actually oh, part of their, uh, what's that? It's one of my favorite terms. I know, endoplasmic reticulum. Yeah, it's, it's kind of hard to say without sounding like a big nerd, right? <laughs> like, oh. the endoplasmic reticulum of a cell. <laughs> I catch myself saying that stuff sometimes, like, ah, whatever. <laughs> so, you know, and so, so certain cells don't have all the same proportion or types of organelles. Like this can, it can vary from cell to cell. Now there's two main types of organelle subcategories. We have the membrane bound and the non-membrane bound organelles. If they're membrane bound, this means that they're surrounded by a plasma membrane. Okay? If they're non-membrane bound, it means that they're kind of naked. They don't have a plasma membrane. It's just sort of protein that's exposed inside the cell. Okay? So let's first talk about the membrane-bound organelles. Uh, these include things like endoplasmic reticulum, <laughs> the Golgi apparatus, or Golgi body, okay? uh, lysosomes, proxosomes, and mitochondria. All of these have specific functions. So in the coming slides, what we'll do is talk about the major functions of each of these organelles, what they look like, where they're found in the cell. But really what I want you guys to know, mostly for an exam or a quiz setting, would be the functions of these organelles. Like if I said, you know, which of the following is a function of the endoplasmic reticulum, you need to be able to pick from a list if that makes sense. So we'll, we'll just cover the major functions of these organelles and I'll talk a little bit about what they look like. Now it turns out there's two types of ER or endoplasmic reticulum. We have smooth ER and rough endoplasmic reticulum or rough ER. The difference between the two is that smooth ER does not have ribosomes attached. Ribosomes are like little studs that attach to uh, this structure. Rough ER has those ribosomes, which means it's kind of studied. It has sort of a roughish looking appearance. If you look at the two types of ER underneath the microscope, smooth ER looks more smooth, rough ER looks more rough, hence the name, okay? So let's first talk about, well, I'll just show you guys where it's located. Now you, you can see endoplasmic reticulum around the nucleus. You might wonder, why is that important? Why, why would it be important to find a lot of endoplasmic reticulum around the nucleus? Well, rough ER is involved in synthesizing protein. Okay. Now, the rough ER gets instructions on how to make that protein from the nucleus. So instructions on how to make protein come from the nucleus, they leave the nucleus, and then they encounter the rough ER, and that's the assembly site for protein. Okay. And it makes sense for it to be close to the nucleus, because there are also enzymes inside the cell that can degrade those instructions. That way the instructions are very brief. Like when you send out, send out an instruction to make a protein, you know, maybe you make that protein, but almost immediately after it's made, that, that instruction gets chopped up and removed. You know, because you wouldn't want a lot of recipes building up inside the cell. Right? <laughs> if the cell didn't get rid of its instructions on how to make protein, you know, then you're just continually making these same proteins over and over and over. 
and that's not very effective. Like things are just built up. So it's important to remove those too. Um, you're going to find smoothie R nearby too, you guys. And smoothie R doesn't have this studded appearance. And so it, it's not involved with making protein. Now, we'll first talk about the smoothie R, you guys. Now, it's continuous with the rough ER. It's involved with um, synthesis, transport, and storage of lipids. So lipids include things like cholesterol, fats, fatty acids, glycerol. Okay? So the smoothie R makes those lipids. Now, it's also involved with the metabolism of carbohydrates. Carbohydrates are sugars, okay, so they include simple sugars or complex sugars. And what's weird, too, is that smoothie R is also involved with detoxification of drugs. So think of, like, pharmaceutical drugs, you know, illicit drugs, alcohol, that kind of stuff. That's broken down by smoothie R. What's really interesting, though, is that smoothie R in drug users, you find a lot more of it. And so this is the anatomical correlate of tolerance. When you think about someone who can take a tremendous amount of a drug, that would actually probably kill somebody else, but they can tolerate, tolerate that really well. Well, their body cells have a lot more smooth ER to break down that drug. So you hear about the situations where people maybe are addicted to a drug, then they stop taking that drug, but maybe they relapse and start taking it again. But they make the mistake of, of taking the same dose maybe that they were used to when they were still a user. But what happens is in the, in the body, you guys, you either use it or lose it. So that if once their cells had a lot of smoothie R, if they weren't encountering as many toxins or drugs, the smoothie R kind of starts to go away a little bit. Not completely, but less abundant, right? And so what they end up doing is overdosing because they think they can still take the doses that, they could, that their body could tolerate back when they were a user, right? So you hear about like celebrities who overdose. Um, uh, there's that one dude from Glee. He like overdosed on heroin a couple years back. Oh, yeah. I don't remember his name, but... but uh, Wait, from what? From Glee, the show. Oh. I don't remember which guy, but I, but I remember reading about it online. One of those one main guys. Yeah, one of the main guys. I don't remember his name though. Um, and then the other guy, the other guy from Glee, just got caught recently in Texas um, with kitty porn. Uh, what? What is going on with Glee, you guys? <laughs> <laughs> what is going on with that show? I never. <laughs> and the show they seem so innocent, right? You got one guy who died of a heroin overdose, and the one who's, I guess. <laughs> A pedophile, so <laughs> that's weird. Um, like two seconds, kitty porn didn't register with me, and I thought you were going cat. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> kitty. I was like, is that a cat? I kitty. Really did. I swear. Oh my I gosh. Because we gotta move on. We're, we're we're recording right now, so we'll, we'll go. <laughs> so rough ER <laughs> is the is the endoplasmic reticulum that's got ribosomes, right? And so the rough ER has a sort of a roughish appearance because the walls of the ER are studded with ribosomes. Ribosomes are the assembly sites for protein, okay? So what happens is that rough ER is involved with making or synthesizing proteins that are secreted by the cell. What I, when I mean secreted, it means it's going to package it into a vesicle, and that vesicle is going to be exocytosed. And so the contents, like the protein contents there, will be dumped out of the cell. You might wonder, well, what's an example of a secreted protein? Insulin. So insulin, which is an important hormone in, in sugar glucose homeostasis, uh, that's a protein that's synthesized by a rough endoplasmic reticulum. And it's secreted by the, this process where the rough ER synthesizes it and packages it into a vesicle, and then eventually it's secreted out of the cell. Okay? Now, um, rough ER is also involved with the synthesis of what are called lysosomes. So, so lysosomes are involved also with detoxification, but they're mostly involved with breaking down... Um, sort of like damaged organelles or waste that might accumulate inside of a cell. Now, uh, the Golgi apparatus, which is apparently the name of, name of a song, too, which I just learned today. Uh, the Golgi apparatus, it's nearby the endoplasmic reticulum, and we call this like the packaging and processing center of, of the cell. In fact, it's a lot like FedEx, surprisingly. Uh -huh. So, UPS. you know, it re or UPS, sorry. So, uh, you know, you, you receive a particular package and it can process it in a certain way and what the Golgi apparatus can do is actually send it to the proper location in the cell. So it's a lot like the FedEx or UPS of a cell. So we have a receiving region and a, and a shipping region um, for the Golgi and this basically looks like this you guys where you might receive a vesicle from, I'm sorry, you might receive a vesicle from another part of the cell. It enters this Golgi apparatus where it's processed along the way. You might wonder what does that mean processed? Well it could be like proteins are maybe chopped up and chopped up into ways that they become active. Or maybe proteins end up getting sugars attached to them to change their function. 
And so the Golgi apparatus can really modify a protein in that way. But then what it'll do is on this end over here, it'll repackage that protein into vesicles, which are then sent to different areas of the cell. Maybe these vesicles are sent to the plasma membrane. Maybe they're sent to a different part of the cell, like the mitochondria. So think of the Golgi apparatus as like the packaging and processing center of the cell. Now, um, it turns out, you guys, that this protein flow through the Golgi apparatus does also um, correlate with the rough ER. So remember I said that rough endoplasmic reticulum makes proteins that are secreted, right? Well, the proteins that are secreted go through the Golgi first. So let's say if, if the rough endoplasmic reticulum makes the protein, the rough ER then sends that, those, those vesicles with protein to the Golgi where it's then processed by the Golgi. Okay? So Golgi apparatus will basically like either cut up that protein or stick other molecules onto it. Um, now, <clears throat> what's interesting then, you guys, is these modified proteins are repackaged into secretory vesicles, and they might be secreted out of the cell. So it's kind of interesting. Now, um, this is what this looks like here, you guys. So here's our rough ER. They get sent over here um, to the Golgi apparatus where they're processed along this pathway, and then they're repackaged into vesicles where then those, those can be secreted. A classic example of this, you guys, insulin. So when, you're, when some of your cells in your body make the hormone insulin, it's a protein, so that, that little code comes from the nucleus, right, the instructions, that, those instructions make it over to the rough ER, where the rough endoplasmic reticulum uses those instructions to make the insulin protein. Then that insulin protein gets packaged into a vesicle by the rough ER. It gets sent towards the Golgi apparatus, where the Golgi then modifies insulin further. And what happens in this process of modification by the Golgi is that Golgi will actually will cut insulin in a way to make it active. And it makes sense from the standpoint of you don't want a hormone synthesized by a cell to activate the same cell that made it, right? So it makes sense then to package this protein in its inactive form, send it to the Golgi, and then the Golgi will activate it, repackage it into a vesicle, and then make sure that it's secreted before it can get into a cell and maybe exert an effect of some sort. You got it. And it makes it ready for use by modifying it. That's why we call it like the processing center, because the Golgi apparatus can modify proteins. Like it can cut them up, it can at attach other molecules to those proteins, and change them in a way to, that makes them more functional. Yeah. Um, and then, I guess, the last question is if, like, if you're um, having trouble, like, in your body with insulin, maybe that you're insulin deficient or, um, you know, whatever that, is that something that's, like, happening on the cellular level like that? <clears throat> Absolutely. Yeah, there could be a condition where, let's say if someone's Golgi secretory pathway wasn't functioning normally and they couldn't get insulin out of the cell, you know, that, that could lead to, to insulin deficiencies. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, so lysosomes, you may have heard about before you guys. Lysosomes, remember, were made by the Golgi apparatus, and some of these are also made by the rough ER. But <clears throat> these are vesicles that contain enzymes that are used to digest wastes, damaged organelles, like dead organelles, um, any kind of debris that might accumulate inside of a cell that needs to be removed, okay? But these lysosomes are also involved with autophagy, which means self-eating, so it can eat its own parts, or autolysis, which basically means uh, cell death. A cell can actually kill itself. You might wonder, why would cells want to kill themselves? Well, there are anti-cancer mechanisms built into all of our cells, okay? So... Sometimes if a cell uh, can sort of self-recognize that it's out of control, it can actually undergo this process of autolysis and kill itself before it damages the rest of the body. Now, <clears throat> when you think about like diseases, when you think about somebody who has cancer, this process of autolysis isn't working properly. So that instead of the cell normally killing itself, it's, it's able to now divide uncontrollably and you know, uh, it might lead to problems in somebody. Now, the, the probability of cancer is really high, by the way. Like, and the lifetime risk of cancer in males is one in two. So one in two males, there's several of us in here, uh, will get cancer in their lifetime. And the lifetime risk of cancer in females is one in three. So it's really high. And a lot of that, you guys, is actually from tobacco use. And second to that are other things. But there are a lot of forms of cancer are lifestyle-related, unfortunately. You know? So, and, many, and many times we're actually doing this to ourselves. Um, <clears throat> now... These lysosomes are their vesicles made by the Golgi, and they contain enzymes that can digest either specific organelles 
the entire inside of the cell, or even help to break down bacteria. So earlier we talked about how there was phagocytosis, which is where a cell can engulf foreign material or bacterium, and it brings that inside the cell through endocytosis, right? And now what happens is then these lysosomes get fused with that vesicle that contains maybe bacteria or waste, and the, lysos the enzymes in those lysosomes start to break down the bacteria or waste that was brought in, okay? And that way your cell can actually help remove that, those materials um, from outside the cell. Now this differs from peroxisomes because peroxisomes are made by um, smooth and rough endoplasmic reticulum. They're smaller than lysosomes and they contain hydrogen peroxide. Hydrogen peroxide is corrosive and what, these, what this is involved with is also degradation of certain materials, uh, but it's also involved with surprisingly, the, well, the breakdown of lipids, but also the synthesis of lipids. And when you think about the functions of peroxisomes, um, think of them as like mobile endoplasmic reticulum. So remember we said the smooth ER was involved with synthesizing lipids and um, meta metabolizing um, carbohydrates, but it's also involved with detoxification of drugs, right? Well, peroxisomes are like little mobile units of smooth ER because they're like little vesicles of a smooth ER that can float around a cell. So they can do these functions kind of more in distant parts of the cell. So they can help break down carbohydrates maybe at, at a distant site inside the cell. Or they can help synthesize lipids nearby too. So it's kind of interesting. Um, now these peroxisomes are also in a vesicle here, you guys. And you can see um, this is using an electron microscope. In fact, this is an example of a, of a transmission electron micrograph. So you're actually looking into the cell and seeing the inside of that vesicle from the inside. <clears throat> now, the mitochondria is also a membrane-bound organelle, so it has its own plasma membrane around it, and we, we call the mitochondria <clears throat> like the powerhouse of the cell, and you guys may have heard of it before. Like a, lot, a lot of uh, textbooks use that phrase, a lot of instructors use that phrase too, and by powerhouse, we're talking about like a power plant, right? Like I don't know who would call a power plant a powerhouse, I've never even heard of that. Dang. Do you guys know if that's a thing? Do people, do you, do you ever drive by and be like, oh, look at that powerhouse, right? It's kind of an old school term. It's an old school term? Yeah. I don't know. I just, I've never heard it used. I've only heard of power plant, right? Yeah. But when we say powerhouse of the cell, we mean that it's like sort of uh, generating a usable form of energy for the cell. Now, sometimes textbooks say that mitochondria create energy, but it's impossible. You can't create energy, right? That, that actually goes against the like laws of nature. Uh, energy can't be created or destroyed, right? It can only be changed into different forms. So what the mitochondria does is it takes chemical energy from food you ingest, and it converts that chemical energy, like in sugars or fats or protein that you're eating, into ATP. And ATP, or adenosine triphosphate, is a usable form of energy for your body's cell, right? Like sugar isn't directly usable, but you can break apart sugar and use the energy and chemical bonds to make ATP, which is a usable form. I'll give you guys an example. Um, you know, like a, a hydroelectric dam. When a river is running down a hill, there's energy being released there, by the way. It's called gravitational potential energy. So for that water rushing down hill, that's releasing energy. Now, it's not a usable form of energy. We can, you can't just power your phone by, like, sticking it in a river, right, and hoping the water, like, charges your phone. That's not going to happen. However, we, have, we can generate special tools. Let's imagine it's like an organelle where we can harness that that movement of water, convert that to a usable form of energy we can use to like charge our phones, watch TV, right? We can use that energy just from water like rushing down a hill, which is actually pretty cool. Think about that with mitochondria though. The mitochondria, it's not water movement here, but there is something going on, it's a movement of other ions, but I won't get into that. Um, but the mitochondria are taking other energies, like chemical energies, and turning that into a usable form for the cell, almost like a power plant, right? Like you can burn coal into a usable form of energy for cells or, not cells, what am I talking about? Um, you know, our society, yeah, homes. <laughs> this projector. <laughs> uh, it's funny. So ATP, adenosine triphosphate, it's got chemical energy that our cells can use to help perform work, like move substances around, do active transport, um, create or destroy molecules, that kind of stuff. Now, um, these mitochondria are kind of bean-shaped organs, and what's really weird about mitochondria, you guys, is they have their own genetic code. In fact, they have their own ribosomes. 
And so the mitochondria almost function independently of the rest of your cell. In fact, it was believed that it's, it's possible that the mitochondria may have been a separate cell at some point in the past, and that through the process of evolution, you know, multiple cells may have come together to form a eukaryote, that, you know, that, that, which is our cells. Because what's odd about mitochondria, you guys, is they're more similar to bacteria than the rest of our cells. So mitochondria have a much more similar to bacteria than the way our cells function. In fact, a mitochondria divides like bacteria. It has, it has the same type of genetic code as bacteria. In fact, its ribosomes are different than the rest of our cells' ribosomes. In fact, mitochondrial ribosomes are more similar to bacterial ribosomes than the rest of our cell. So it's funky. We almost have like this alien living inside of our cell that's, make, that's like making ATP for our cells. It's weird, you guys. I know, right? <laughs> we call it the endosymbiotic theory or hypothesis. Do you have a question? Good question. So basically, uh, the, the, so the question uh, boils down to when do cells sort of differentiate or turn into certain cell types? And that bo all boils back down to development. Um, now, development is a really complex process. It occurs prenatally and a little bit postnatally too, but it's going to occur within the first several weeks of, of uh, uh, after fertilization. If that makes sense. So as these cells are dividing. What happens is that there's a lot of changes in gene expression. And there's also a cross communication between the cells that are present, and they all sort of differentiate in a way based on the cells that are around them and based on their genes or genetic code. And so we're sort of we have this pre-programmed script within our DNA that really helps determine embryologically what cells become what. Now, where that could be affected would be like, let's say if you encountered a toxin or a drug early on in, in fetal development, that could change how those cells change, divide. Absolutely. Yeah, I'll give you this example. Um, pregnant mothers who are infected by influenza, they're more likely to have a child with schizophrenia. It's a correlation, but it's an interesting correlation. Um, Another one too, guys, uh, rubella virus, which is protected by the MMR vaccine. You know, well, there's a lot of people who are choosing not to get vaccinated nowadays, but that particular virus causes really severe mutations in pregnant mothers. So say if a pregnant mother was never vaccinated for MMR, she ended up contracting a rubella virus while pregnant, that could actually cause really debilitating mutations in her fetus. So, and that's just exposure to, you know, pathogens. But what about toxins? There's lots of examples. I, we can go on, but that's more of a pathophysiology type of uh, uh, focus of discussion, which we'll get to later, like in fourth quarter. You know, but uh, I'm trying not to go on super like large tangents. Usually, so the question was about stem cells and how stem cells might differentiate into one type of cell versus another. That relates to growth factors. So there's certain types of growth factors that can induce a stem cell to differentiate maybe. Okay, I'll give you an example. There's a pluripotent stem cell, which, is, which develops really early on following fertilization. Those pluripotent stem cells can turn to any type of cell in the human body. And it's been, a, it's been a focus of scientific research because what if you could harvest that cell? That Theoretically, then, you can grow any organ or tissue, right? The problem with that as a therapy, uh, though, is that, you know, unless it's your own body cell, if you're getting it from another organism or person, if that makes sense, it's going to be considered foreign by your immune system because it'll have different, um, you know, proteins on the surface. But, uh, you know, it's and the, the answer is not that simple, though, because... If it, if it were, we would have those technologies available. We can maybe get a pluripotent cell and totally induce that to turn into any specific type of cell we want. That, that technology is not there yet. So I think that's not super well understood, but it's a great question. Oh, yeah. Yep. So um, what about the non-membrane or bound organelles? So the non-membrane bound organelles, you guys, they don't have a membrane. Okay. So they just have sort of a naked 
protein sort of structure to them. So the non-membrane bound organelles include ribosomes, cytoskeleton, centrosome and centrioles, cilia, flagella, microvilli. So what were the functions of ribosomes? Do you guys remember? What's a, what does a ribosome do? Yeah, it's the assembly site for protein. But ribosomes need several things. They need the instructions on that protein, but they also need the, the, the units that come together to make protein. Okay? So think of the ribosome as like the kitchen for protein. right? It receives the recipe from the nucleus, and it puts all the ingredients together to make your dish, which is the protein. right? So ribosomes are the assembly site for protein. Now, uh, the cytoskeleton is exactly what it sounds like. It's a skeleton of the cell, so it basically just helps support the cell structure. Centrosomes and centrioles are involved with uh, being the, the attachment point for the cytoskeleton, and they're also necessary for cell division. Cilia and flagella are motile or movable components of the cell. Do you guys know which one's the big one? The flagellum. The flagellum, right? And so what, what kind of cells have flagella? Sperm cells, exactly. So the flagellum is a big whip-like structure. And it turns out through recent investigation, you guys, it turns out that flagella don't wiggle like this. You know, might you might guess that it kind of wiggles like a like a sal what am I thinking of? Tadpole tail, you know? It turns out flagella actually wiggle like a corkscrew. And that corkscrew movement is what propels the sperm forward. That's weird, I know. But if you look at it from a from a two-dimensional view, it looks like like that. But in three dimensions, you see it's actually a corkscrew type of movement, which is funky. But um, Now, what about microvilli? Do they move? They don't. So microvilli are just sort of stiff projections of the cell that are involved with absorption of substances. So if microvilli are involved with absorption, what types of cells do you guys think would have a lot of microvilli? What are some cells that need to absorb a lot? Maybe lung cells. That's a great guess. It turns out you don't find that you don't find microvilli in the lungs, but you could you could guess and expect them to be there, but they're not there actually. So where, where else where else do you get a lot of absorption? Digestive. Yeah, digestive tract. In fact, you find a lot of microvilli in the cells that line your digestive tract because you have to absorb a tremendous amount of nutrients from the food you eat. Okay. So let's go through those organelles one more time. It turns out there's two, there's two main types of ribosomes. We have free and fixed ribosomes. Free ribosomes are kind of floating around the cell. They make protein that stays inside the cell. Okay? Fixed ribosomes you find on endoplasmic reticulum, or ER, and they make protein that's secreted, like out of the cell. We talked about that earlier. So the difference between free and fixed is that free ribosomes float unattached to other organelles, and they make protein that stays inside the cell. Fixed ribosomes are fixed to rough ER and... They produce protein that's secreted by the cell. Now, do you guys know that most antibiotics target bacterial ribosomes? Bacterial ribosomes. Like if you take an antibiotic for a bacterial infection, most of those drugs target the ribosomes of bacteria. But why doesn't it affect our ribosomes? Like if you're taking a drug that blocks ribosomes, what do you guys think? Do you think we have the same ribosomes as bacteria? No, no exactly. They're different enough to where the drug can affect bacterial ribosomes, but not our ribosomes. That way we can block synthesis of protein in bacteria, but not human cells. So why specifically ribosomes then? Like what, what is specifically about blocking protein production keeps production of protein all the time? Well, the, the cell can't grow. Yes? Oh, nice. Good. Good catch. I was kind of trying to imply that. I was trying to get too political here, you guys. Who had... <laughs> You're right. Mitochondria have ribosomes that are very similar to bacterial, bacterial ribosomes. So what does this mean in terms of antibiotics? Well, it's possible then that antibiotics are actually toxic to our mitochondria. Maybe not the entire cell, but our mitochondria. And so you might see some me metabolic deficits um, from excessive antibiotic use. Could be. Uh, resistance comes about through evolution, actually, which is interesting. You know, people say they don't believe in evolution, but it's a real phenomenon. Like all living things change, and if you if you apply an external factor, you're going to affect the development of these bacteria, and they'll change in a certain way as a result. Um, and so, really, what bacterial resistance is, and we'll get back to this later in other classes. And I like these questions, guys, um, but uh, it's just a process of evolution. We're seeing evolution 
as it's occurring. What happens is the bacteria are changing and now are no longer resist. I'm sorry, they're no longer as susceptible to our drug because they've changed enough to now it doesn't affect them. So it's interesting. Um, so uh, what we see here, you guys, is this basically what the ribosomes kind of look like. So there's different subunits that come together. They stick together. They've got a little channel in the center that uh, messenger RNA comes through. That's the that's the uh, instruction for protein. And these ribosomes uh, are pretty quickly. I mean, they can work pretty quickly. And what's interesting is they can receive multiple, um, I'm sorry, each code or instruction can run through multiple ribosomes at once. So if each ribosome is the assembly site for protein, and it runs through like six ribosomes at the same time, that means you're making six proteins from one instruction. It's kind of cool. So our cells are really efficient that way. Um, certain organisms like viruses can hijack, they can hijack your ribosomes to make their own proteins, right? So you think of like an influenza virus, you know, it can hijack our cells' ribosomes to make viral proteins. So it'll use our own cell's machinery for it to replicate or divide, which is interesting. So what about the skeleton of the cell, the cytoskeleton? Well, the cytoskeleton has three main components. We got microfilaments, intermediate filaments, and microtubules. It turns out that microfilaments are involved with uh, movement of the cell. So if you think about cells that move a lot, they have a lot of microfilaments. So can you, can you guys think of any cells that might move or change shape? Skin. Um, well, they will. They change shape due to you know, the accumulation of, of adipose. But what are some other cells that would move, help to move materials around the body? Intestinal cells. Muscle cells, which you find in a heart to move blood or in the intestine to move intestinal uh, components. So muscle cells have a lot of microfilaments. And these microfilaments are the, are the types of cytoskeletal elements that are actually producing contraction to you know, transmit that force. Uh, intermediate filaments, you guys, are just sort of like in between size. And they're just involved with additional support for the cell. And microtubules are the largest of these three types of cytoskeletal elements. Microtubules are, they do a couple things. First of all, microtubules are involved with transportation of cellular material. So when, it's, when uh, an organelle might need to be moved to a different part of the cell, it sticks to a microtubule railroad network, and it's actually kind of transported along that railroad, railroad network of microtubules around the cell. It's actually pretty amazing. I'll, I'll show you guys a video of this coming up. Now, uh, the intermediate filaments, again, are just sort of an intermediate type of support structure. And then going back to microtubules again, you guys, um, this is, microtubules are also necessary for cell division. Um, so if the cytoskeleton is involved with cell movement, support, and division, this is also a potential pharmacological target, right? Like if you understand then that microtubules are necessary for a cell to divide, what if someone had cancer and you gave them a drug that blocked the formation of microtubules. Well, then any cell that's currently dividing couldn't divide. And so some of the chemotherapeutic drugs affect cells that are dividing, and they can target these things. So it's interesting. Um, so microfilaments, like I said, you guys, are involved with changing cell shape and muscle contraction. And they're basically composed of a protein called actin that intertwines in helical strands, and they can uh, basically pull on each other to change the shape of a cell. Uh, intermediate filaments are just sort of a sort of an intermediate size um, cytoskeletal element, and they really just help stabilize the junctions between cells. Microtubules are hollow tubes that are larger. They radiate from a central region called the centrosome, and they do several different things. They help affix organelles in place. They maintain sh cell shape and rigidity. They direct the movement of organelles, and they allow the cell to move or allow chromosomes to move during cell division. So microtubules are pretty important. If there's a disease of microtubules, it's pretty dramatic, right? So I'll give, I'll give you an example. Um, you know, Alzheimer's disease can influence the formation of microtubules. And so if these cells have less structure and support, then they have difficulty forming new connections, right? And which means you have difficulty forming new memories. And so something as simple as changing one type of organelle in a cell can lead to pretty dramatic disorders. Now, uh, what this looks like then, you guys, here's the centrosome, and you get these little helical structures here that the microtubules radiate off of. So the blue ones here are microtubules. 
We have these ones here called intermediate filaments, which can change their size to help move a cell around. And then microfilaments you find on the edge of, a, of the cell to basically help anchor the cell to another, to another nearby cell. In fact, if we, look at the, um, if we look at a video of a cell moving, and I'll pull this up on YouTube once my computer cooperates. Um, let's check this out. So if we go to you, oh, dang it. If we go to YouTube, I'll show you guys this this movement of a cell. Um, let's do cell chemotaxis. This is one of my favorites, by the way. So this is this is a video of an immune cell. Actually, I'm take it back. Sorry, this is not it. <laughs> this one I want. There we go. This is in a video of an immune cell chasing a bacterial cell. But how do cells chase anything? Well, they don't have feet to run, but they can change their shape in order to kind of undulate towards another object. So here's the bacterium trying to escape. That's the bacterium, little one, yep. Well, it's running away. Here's the immune cell right here. And you can see it's kind of chasing it. <laughs> I've seen the same video, you guys, and it's got that. So what did, what did it do there? Once it got it, it engulfed it. And what and through what process did it engulf that bacteria? Phagocytosis. Nice. So it's endocytosis where it kind of puts it in a vesicle, brings it in. What happens next to that bacteria? Does it stay there forever? No. It's broken down by... It's phagocytosis, but you got to have other vesicles fuse and bring in enzymes to break down that bacteria. So what vesicles fuse with the, with the vesicle that um, grab the bacteria? You guys remember? Lysosome. You got it. So lysosomes will fuse and start to digest that bacteria. So when you think about if you have an infection and you clear off that infection, that's what the cells are doing. Some, some of the time. Not all the time. But some of this are, are the bacteria being removed by literally your cells are eating them and then breaking them apart which is actually pretty cool. So you might wonder, how, does it, how is this cell moving? Well, like I said, it doesn't have feet to move, but it's, the way it's moving is it's changing its cytoskeleton in real time by like pulling on one side of the cytoskeleton, maybe relaxing the other, it can start to pull the entire cell in a direction. And so how does the cell know to do this? It's basically gene expression. So, and how does the cell know the bacteria is there? Well, it has receptors to sense whether the bacteria is present or not. So the bacteria is giving off different molecules. That immune cell can, can kind of sense those molecules with receptors and then chase it down and follow that chemical scent trail the bacteria is leaving behind. It's pretty amazing. So is it actually, is it actually running from it? Like, does it sense also that cell, or is it just kind of moving around? I think it's just kind of moving around. Okay. Yeah, I don't think the bacteria can, can really know it's being chased. Okay. That's a great question. It is, yeah, it's super advanced. I mean, super complicated, right? Like, if if you guys were given the task of de designing a robot to do the same thing, that would take a lot of programming and really interesting uh, uh, engineering. Yeah, totally. It's a great question. So uh, the question was, uh, you know, <clears throat> if, if your cells are determined by their genes, you know, is this why we're, we're looking at genetic screening for different diseases, you know, or cancer? It's absolutely true. Because although humans all have the same genes, we all have different forms of genes. So humans have about 25,000 genes. That's it. It only takes 25,000 different genes to make a human, which is actually more simple if you think about it. But it's obviously a lot more complex than that. Now, Although we all have the same genes, we have different forms of genes. Like I'll give you guys an example. Like, you know, you might have a dollar bill from the United States. What if you had a Canadian dollar? It, although they're both dollars, they're different enough to where they look different, right? Mm -hmm. So that's like the, that's like the genes in, our, in human cells. So 
looking at genetic susceptibility, you can look at the form of a gene someone has to determine whether they're susceptible to a disease or not. And we know about what forms do correlate with certain diseases. Like we know about the forms of genes that are associated with different cancers, like breast cancer, ovarian cancer. So Alzheimer's disease too. So it's pretty interesting. Now, uh, going back though to the cytoskeleton, what we see here on this slide, you guys, uh, we have the centrosome and the centriole. The centrosome is the spherical structure that's by the nucleus, and it has these centrioles that are sort of angled at right angle to each other. Each centriole are microtubules that are arranged in kind of a barrel shape, and that's the uh, microtubule packaging center. So right, where, it's mi where microtubules are created and assembled, so the microtubules will radiate away from the centriole. Okay, so that think of this as like the cell center. The centriole is like the very center of that cell because all other microtubules will radiate away from that. You know, think about where all roads in Denver might lead back to. You know, I guess I suppose they all kind of lead back to downtown, and downtown would be like the centriole of Denver, I suppose. <laughs> so what does this look like? Um, here we can see the centriole, and there's microtubules that radiate off. And this is an important organelle because it's involved in making microtubules. Okay? So basically of an important cell structure. Now, uh, it turns out that these are also associated with cilia and flagella, which are the movable components of a cell. So we talked about how there were cell extensions like cilia and flagella. So cilia were the smaller cell extensions that we saw earlier that kind of wave back and forth. Flagella were the, lo were the larger whip-like extensions, right? These both move, and they move in a, in a process that requires ATP, so it takes energy to get these things to move. But it turns out cilia and, and flagella are really just projections of microtubules that go up along the plasma membrane. So then there's parts of plasma membrane that kind of stick up and project out away from the cell. Think of this as like an extension, right? Like if the microtubule is like a bone of your body, well, there's bones in my arm, and my arm can kind of stick out away from my body, right? And I can move it around. So this could be like a flagellum on a cell, right? Or if my fingers have bones, they kind of project away from my hand, you know, they can kind of move too. That would be like a cilia on a hand. <laughs> Those are weird examples, but um, cilia, you guys, are smaller, and the cilia are involved with helping to move materials across the cell surface. So you're going to find cilia in parts of your body where you want to move materials around. Um, so I'll give you an example of this is like the respiratory tract. You know, if you inhale a lot of dust or debris, it gets trapped in your lungs, but that gets removed by these cilia because they can help kind of wave it out. And so they, they help move that dirty mucus up out of your lungs where you're going to swallow that mucus um, at some point. Now, the flagellum are longer extensions you find on sperm cells. And these aren't involved with moving materials across the cell surface. This is involved with moving the entire cell in a particular direction. Um, now, this is showing the example of what cilia look like here, you guys. So you can see on this slide how the cilia are just these little extensions on the cell surface. They're going to help wave this mucus in a particular direction. Because for whatever reason, they can all kind of wave in the same direction, which is interesting. And by waving the same direction, you're helping to move something in a specific direction. In the example of your respiratory tract, that direction happens to be up and out of your lungs. So if you inhale any dust or other debris, you can get out of your lungs by using cilia, which is actually pretty cool. Because if you think about it, we encounter a lot of dust in our atmosphere. I mean, you can't really see it very well right now, but I guarantee you guys, if there were a beam of sunlight shining through this room, and you look at the cross-section of that beam, you see all these little particles floating in the air, right? Well, take a deep breath. Guess what? You just inhale all those particles. Well, what if your body didn't remove them? So they would just get trapped in your lung. Now, although they're small over the course of years, that would be a lot of debris that would stay in your lungs. That's not good. Um, fortunately, we have this mucociliary ladder of cilia that can remove that debris out. But what's unfortunate at, are some of the chemicals you find in smoke, like tobacco smoke, inhibit ciliary function. So it's a double whammy. Not only are you inhaling a lot of like tar and debris, but it's also preventing the cilia from allowing to remove that debris from your lungs. So uh, it's kind of interesting. Yeah, it does. <laughs> so then here's the flagellum over here, you guys. So it's kind of a, it's a lot longer whip-like extension. Uh, remember, microvilli are non-motile. These don't move, but they can stiffen. And when they stiffen, they kind of stick straight up. So instead of laying flat on the surface of the cell, they stick straight up. And these microvilli are involved with absorption. So we said you find them in areas where you need a lot of absorption in the cell. So one example would be uh, in the small intestine, because that's where most absorption occurs. 
And so the cells that line your small intestine have an abundant amount of microvilli, so you get a lot of absorption. You might wonder, well, how do these aid in absorption? Well, if a cell has lots of extensions that stick up, there's more surface on that cell, right? Like, a, think about a comb, you know? Um, for every little extension on that comb, there's, there's a lot more surface area on each little extension. If they're really abundant on the surface of that comb, then you have a lot of surface area there, right? Those are all potential sites where you can absorb nutrients into a cell. That's what microvilli are for. So what if someone had, had a disease of microvilli? What if their microvilli were less abundant? What's going to happen, do you think, in that case? Yeah, they're not going to absorb nutrients as well, and that could lead to malnutrition. Exactly. So there are certain inflammatory diseases of the bowel, like you know, uh, Crohn's disease, exactly, ulcerative colitis, that can affect the absorption of nutrients. And so in those individuals with these sort of disorders or diseases, um, they can become malnourished. And that's, that's due to a loss of microvilli. So we're picking up here, talking about the nucleus. Remember, that's the control center of your cell. It contains most of your genetic code. And the nucleus, interestingly enough, you know, it has its own membrane. We don't call it a membrane-bound organelle, but it does have its own membrane around it. It has its own plasma membrane. It's a lipid bilayer. We call this the nuclear envelope, and it really helps encase all of your genetic material within the nucleus. You might wonder, why would the nucleus need a nuclear envelope? Well, the envelope helps, helps keep your chromosomes in place. Your chromosomes are structured a lot like ramen noodles, surprisingly. They kind of, they're kind of coiled, and they... They get stuck in these interesting arrangements. Now, when those chromosomes are relaxed, it's kind of like cooked ramen noodles where they're sort of floating around like a bowl of noodles, right? And they, they're kind of loose, and they could spread throughout your cell. You wouldn't want that because that could potentially damage, damage that DNA or chromosome. Now, on the center of the nucleus, we have something called the nucleolus, and the nucleolus is the site of ribosomal RNA synthesis, and this is involved with protein synthesis as well. Um, something else you find in the nucleus, you guys, would be obviously DNA, which makes up your chromosomes, chromatin, which is the DNA wrapped around histone proteins, and chromosomes, which is basically you know, uh, one molecule of DNA, one long molecule of DNA is a chromosome. Now, the nuclear envelope, like I mentioned earlier, you guys, it's a double membrane-bound structure. It helps encase the nucleus, and it controls the entry and exit of molecules between the nucleus and cytoplasm. There are things inside of your cell that could potentially damage your DNA. Like we have enzymes in the cytoplasm of our, of our cells called DNases, which could break down DNA. And you don't want those enzymes from getting in the nucleus. Okay, you don't want them to get in there. So what prevents the entry of those e enzymes would be the nuclear envelope. So there's small little nuclear pores then that allow only certain small molecules to enter or exit the nucleus. Okay. Um, now, in the center of the nuclei, we have, I'm sorry, the, the nucleus, we have the nucleoli. They're kind of like these darkly staining bodies. They're composed of RNA, enzymes, and proteins, and they're responsible for making one of the subunits for ribosomes. Like I said, the nucleoli are involved with protein synthesis, but it's because the nucleoli make the things that are used to make protein. Okay, so when you think of like the, where, where do ribosomes come from? You know, if ribosomes make protein, well, What's making the ribosomes? Well, it's the nucleoli. So part of the ribosome is actually the nucleolus, or due to the nucleolus. So uh, if you look at a typical nucleus here, you guys, this is the nuclear envelope. It surrounds the outside of the cell. In the center here is the nucleolus, which is the place where ribosomal RNA is synthesized. That's used to make uh, ribosomes. And the rest of this is chromatin. So all of this sort of material here in the nucleoplasm is chromatin. And chromatin is basically DNA, and it's packaging proteins, because DNA is wrapped around these packaging proteins that give it something to attach to. So uh, all of that's called chromatin, and uh, chromatin can either be condensed or relaxed. When chromatin is condensed, it forms a chromosome that kind of looks like this. You guys may have seen chromosomes like X, you know, maybe they kind of are a little smaller. You've seen chromosomes being represented in these forms. Well, this is where chromatin is condensed, because within this, you have DNA that's like just really tightly coiled within this, okay, which makes a chromosome-looking structure. Now, what can happen, though, is that when this chromatin relaxes, right, let's just say relax, it might actually look something like this, like just kind of like thin little lines that, that go all throughout the nucleus. In fact, when chromatin is relaxed, it's more likely to be expressed. Like, you actually can access the genes that are here, Whereas when it's condensed, you can't access the genes there. Okay? 
So in a living cell that's not currently dividing, your DNA actually, the chromosomes aren't in this structure. Chromosomes are actually in their relaxed state here. The chromatin's relaxed. That way you can access those genes. You know, if it's te too tightly packaged, you can't get to those genes, and therefore they can't be expressed. So when you think about a living cell that's not dividing, it's going to look more like this. We really, you don't really see much chromosome here. In fact, if you look at a nucleus from an electron microscope, you can see it just looks like a bunch of kind of grayish material. However, if this cell started to get ready to divide, this chromatin could condense into something that looks like this chromosome, right? A little X thing. And we'll come back to that here in a little bit with cell division. Now, um, DNA is deoxyribonucleic acid. You know, it's a complex molecule that contains, that's your genetic material, contains your genetic code. And when DNA is uh, wrapped around um, these histone proteins, we call this chromatin. And um, during cell division, chromatin will condense or coil tightly into chromosome, which is what we saw up here. So when the DNA is condensed, it'll form a chromosome, like we saw on the board here, that kind of X-shaped structure. So if you look at the structure of DNA at its, in its molecular form, we know it's a double helix type of structure. And this double helix has a phosphate backbone, a ribose sugar here. And then these little parts, these little peg parts here, are um, called the nucleotides. And there's only four main types of nucleotides that make up DNA. We have A, T, G, and C, or adenine, thymine, guanine, cytosine. And it's only those four nucleotides that make up your DNA code. So it's pretty interesting how everything that makes you you genetically, is only due to four different types of molecules. So it's pretty amazing. But it's the combinations of those molecules that determine what your genes are, which determine what the proteins are, which help determine what you are. So it's kind of cool. Um, this DNA is actually wrapped around histone proteins. And when DNA is wrapped around histones, we call that chromatin. Histones are a type of packaging protein. Um, up until recently, these were mostly ignored because they were thought to just be you know, a, a structural element of the chromosome that weren't important. What we're determining now is that histones actually have their own type of molecular arrangement that can change. But what's weird about histones is they change based on your environmental experience, like how you live your life. So however you live your life changes how histones are shaped, which changes whether or not DNA is wrapped around that histone tightly or loosely. Remember earlier I said how if DNA is wrapped around histones tightly, you can't really express that gene really well? Well, then you're less likely to, you know, um, have the effect of that gene. But what if it's wrapped around the histone more loosely? It's more likely to be expressed. You have a greater effect on that gene. Well, what's the evidence for how experience can influence histone arrangement? Well, and here's what's crazy, guys, is you can inherit his, this histone arrangement from your parents. So what this means is however your parents live their life, you inherited that histone arrangement, which affects your gene expression. So it used to be thought that you just inherit your genes. It doesn't matter what your previous generation did or lived because, you know, things kind of reset. That's not true. However you live your life can change how histones are shaped, which can also affect gene expression in future generations. So what's the evidence for this? Well, the evidence here, and it's been observed many times, uh, one of the most classic examples is how if you have relatives that lived in famine, they're more likely to have expressed the genes that are involved with conserving energy in your body, right? Like if you didn't have a lot of food available to you back in the day and your, your, your ancestors have been starving for a long period of time, then they're going to express genes to conserve energy more so. Well, what about future generations? Let's say um, you have a future generation where they're still expressing those genes that helps them conserve energy, but now they're no longer in famine and they have an abundant amount of food. If you have the genes that are that are can help you conserve energy, but you have a lot of food, what's that going to lead to? Obesity. Obesity. So what's interesting is that you have uh, you can see higher rates of obesity in individuals whose ancestors lived in famine. And if you measure histone um, protein arrangement, you see that it's different than other people. Um, this can relate. This potentially could relate to a variety of different things. Neurological phenomena may be heritable. So it gets weird. And I don't want to go, it's kind of a rabbit hole that you can really dive down into. Um, but it's interesting to think about how uh, your, the, the activities of the daily life of your ancestors actually affects your gene expression today. Would, would that like change eventually if, if 
Yeah. Yeah, it could definitely change. In fact, if you look at the histones of identical twins, which you, you expect to have the same exact orientation, they are when they're born. You know, they have the same exact type of histone we call methylation. I won't go. Into, I won't get into that. But they, they're basically identical. If those twins were separated at birth, they become increasingly dissimilar over time, which means that over the course of a lifetime, you look at those twin identical twins separated at birth. They although they started out similar. It's not that their, their genes didn't change, the histone proteins change, which means that their DNA is packaged differently, which means they're expressing different genes. And so over time, although they're identical twins, they become more and more dissimilar. This is one of the reasons why certain twins get certain diseases or other twins don't. So it's, it's kind of weird. Um, although if those identical twins lived in the same environment, presumably they wouldn't be as dissimilar, if that makes sense. Yeah. So it gets funky. And I'm, I hope that you guys didn't, don't misinterpret what I'm saying. I'm not saying that you can change your genes. I'm just saying you can change how your DNA is packaged, which can affect gene expression, like whether those genes are on or off. Um, but that's also dependent on your life experience. What if I told you guys there's drugs that can affect histones? It's true. Yeah, there are. Demethylation drugs. There's drugs that affect how your DNA is packaged. So what's that going to do to future generations? I don't think we know yet. But that that kind of terri that terrifies me. One of the uh, one of the uh, anti-inflammatory drugs does that. I don't remember the name of it. Um, like for allergies, I don't remember the name of it. Claritin. Yeah, one of those. I'm not going to try. I'm not going to give a name because it's being recorded. Like an antihistamine. Maybe an antihistamine. I don't know. Well, let's look it up later because I don't want to get sued for for like <laughs> saying the wrong thing. <laughs> Designed to do that or is no, well, yeah, they're designed because they have, a, they have a, a, a certain effect, you know, that, that's desired, but we don't know what the long-term effects are. Like, genera generationally, what's that going to do? We don't know, but it's interesting. All right, guys, so let's talk about the, the cell cycle, which is basically just cell division. Now, um, you know, we know that our cells in our, our body are dividing, but not all cells in your body are always actively dividing, right? Especially if you're fully grown. Um, some cells are dividing more rapidly than others. And the, the cells that need to divide more rapidly are often the ones that encounter a lot of trauma, right? Um, so if you guys can, can give some, some guesses, what cells in your body do you guys think divide the most rapidly? Skin cells. You guys know how often you replace your skin? Not that quick. Yeah. It's about every two months you replace your skin. I know. So you think about yourself two months ago, you got a, you got a different skin. By the way, where does that skin go? It kind of slips off, ends up in the air, you know, ends up as dust in your house, yeah, in your pillow, yeah. How is it that you have scars that last forever? Well, the, the scar relates to the underlying tissue and skin, okay. and but we'll come back to that later. I just curious because it's if you're replacing skin cells. Right, you think about kind of like fresh, yeah. Um, so the life cycle of a given cell, you guys, has several different phases. When a cell is not actively dividing, we call this as being an interphase. Interphase is that pe period of time where the cell is not currently active, actively dividing, but it's just being a cell, doing its thing, and sort of undergoing normal metabolic activities. Now, it can also prepare for cell division during this phase, and, but when a cell is actively dividing, we call this the mitotic phase. So interphase has three subphases. We have G1, S, and G2. Uh, G1 phase is a growth phase. This is where the cell just came out of division. It's a newly formed cell, and it's starting to regrow, if that makes sense. Now, during G1, this is where it actually can prevent itself from dividing any further, and it's halted at what we call a G1 restriction point. And so cells that aren't currently dividing are probably most often in G1. They're just kind of growing. Uh, they're just doing undergoing normal metabolism, not even preparing for cell division, just being a cell, doing what it's doing, right? Well, the next phase after G1 is the S phase. S phase, S for synthesis, because during X, S phase, the cell is starting to prepare for division. It does this by replicating its organelles, and it starts to prep for cell division. Okay? During G2, what happens, you guys, is that um, more organelle replication occurs. Other enzymes that are necessary for cell division are also produced. And the G2 phase is immediately what precedes M phase which is mitosis. So if we look at, if we look at this um, as a circle, because cell division really is a cycle here, you know. so uh, what we see then, you guys, is that um, coming out of cell division, what we find then is that you get two cells. And let's just say that this cell is the same as this one. 
immediately it enters G1 or growth phase. During G1, the cell just kind of does its thing, and it's halted at what we call the G1 checkpoint or restriction point, and that prevents the cell from dividing any further. Okay? There are things that can take that cell out of the restriction point, which means it can stimulate the cell to divide or grow. If that uh, is removed from its restriction point, then the cell enters S phase, which is a period of replication and growth. So the cell starts replicating its organelles, replicating its chromosomes, and preparing for cell division. G2 is sort of like a checkpoint phase. At this period of time in, in G2, what's happening is you still get more organelle replication, but the cell's checking different things and making sure that everything is ready for cell division to begin. Because before that cell can divide, you need to have copies of everything, right? You need to have multiple mitochondria, multiple organelles, multiple copies of chromosomes, even before it starts dividing. Because if those weren't ready to divide and you didn't have an extra copy, that means only one cell is going to get that one copy and the other, one, the other cell is going to be gypped, right? Does that happen where it doesn't have all the proper things and then it just uses like the... Yeah, exactly. Yep, and that can totally happen. You know, for the most part, it happens appropriately, but, you know, we're not completely efficient. Like, bless you. The human body is not totally efficient as a kind of like a machine, um, so these errors can, can occur. Um, now, after G2, you guys, we can enter the M phase here. M phase is the mitosis phase, and there's, there's several main phases of mitosis. We got prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, that's the M phase. And then the last phase you guys hear is the cytokinesis, is where the cells kind of bud apart. Now, from one cell, you have two. Now, these are names for the, the, the look or structure of the chromosome. So during prophase, the nucleus breaks down. In fact, you guys look here, there's no nucleus present, right? The nucleus is gone, and now the chromosomes are kind of out inside the cell, okay? In metaphase, the chromosomes line up in the center of the cell, and the centrioles separate here, and these chromosomes then are attached to what we call the mitotic spindle, which is basically microtubules that stick onto those, those chromosomes and prepare them to be split apart. Okay? In uh, anaphase here, what's happening is the, the mitotic spindles are now pulling the chromosomes apart, and then each copy of the chromosome goes to a different end of the cell. So one copy of this chromosome goes to this side of the cell, one copy of this chromosome goes to this side of the cell. And that way each cell will get at least one copy of a chromosome. Okay? We call that anaphase. And then during telophase, what happens is the cell, those little sister chromatids that separate, start to get repackaged into a nucleus, and the cell starts to prepare to bud apart. That, that actual budding of the cell occurs during cytokinesis. Cyto means cell, kinesis means movement. So cytokinesis is where the cells actually they kind of split apart. Your question? Fast. Like Pretty fast. Seconds? Minutes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it does. Um, but many cells, this can, this can be as fast as minutes. Um, so let's go through those phases of the uh, cell cycle, you guys. During interphase, you know, maybe the cell is just kind of doing its thing, right? We can see our nucleus here. We got our centrioles that are paired, and the cell is just kind of being a cell, right? Doing whatever it's doing. Now, uh, once it passes G2, it'll enter the M phase or mitos mitosis phase here. And the M phase has four main phases, right? We have prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase. In fact, you can remember this is PMAT, right? So PMAT, P-M-A-T, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase. And prophase is really uh, characterized by a breakdown of the nucleus. We can start to see individual chromosomes kind of present. M M uh, metaphase is characterized as chromosomes lining up in the center of the cell at what we call the metaphase plate. Anaphase is where the sister chromatids now start to get pulled apart or separated. And then telophase is where those sister chromatids or separated chromosomes start to get reformed in a new nucleus at other ends of the cell. What's not on here, though, is cytokinesis because technically cytokinesis is not part of my mitosis. But cytokinesis does follow mitosis, and it's basically the last phase here where the cells, they butt apart. Okay? So what does this look like? Well, going back here, you guys, remember the prophase where the nucleus breaks down. M phase, where uh, chromosomes line up in the metaphase plate. Anaphase, where the chromosomes get separated. And then telophase, where those chromosomes start to reform back in their own little nuclei here. And then uh, what happens last before interphase, guys, is cytokinesis. 
So uh, just kind of going through this some, and one more time, you guys, we have prophase where the chromosome breaks down. and I'm sorry, not the chromosome. The nucleus breaks down, and we can see then our chromosomes present here. These chromosomes start to attach to the mitotic spindle. Uh, metaphase, where the chromosomes line up at the mitotic spindle here, or metaphase plate, and they get attached to my microtubules. Now, each of these centrosomes here um, will pull each copy of the chromosome to opposite ends. So for this one chromosome, there's two copies. One copy of that chromosome will go to this side. One copy of this chromosome goes to this side. Right? Um, so it's like an equal split, if that makes sense. Uh, and then anaphase is where the chromosomes start to get pulled apart. In fact, these are called sister chromatids, so like a smaller copy of the chromosome. So each of these sister chromatids goes to the opposite ends of the cell. Um, and they're basically just copies of each other. And then telophase is characterized by when the sister chromatids start to get repackaged into a new nucleus, and the cell forms a cleavage furrow where it starts to prepare for um, cytokinesis or division. Now, uh, what we're going to do wrap, is to wrap up this chapter, you guys, is talking about uh, aging in the cell. Now, now, aging is a very complex process as far as cells go. And you might wonder, what a weird thing. Why do people age? Like, why don't we just grow and stay, you know, young forever? Well, there's actually interesting processes that can occur in cells. And um, although we won't go into much detail on that whole aging process in this chapter, there are some interesting concepts that we'll just introduce just as a kind of a introduction to aging. So it's, a nor it's considered a normal process, right? Because we're all aging, right? As soon as you stop growing, you're aging. And it's, it's a continuous process because it can't be stopped. Although there are some companies out there that are trying to figure out how to at least slow down or reverse the effects of aging. Um, I know Google has a, you know, Google has a new company. It's called Alphabet. Like, don't, it's not called Google anymore. But Alphabet includes a series of other sub-companies, which includes Google. But one of the Alphabet companies, which is Google, um, is, a, is basically a biotech company that's trying to figure out anti-aging methods or medications because people will pay a lot of money to stop or reverse aging, right? Think about how many billionaires are on this planet. And if they'll pay a billion dollars to give 20 extra years of life, that's big money right there. And so Google knows this. and are trying to figure that out. So it's kind of interesting. We might enter a future, you guys, where rich people like live forever. I know, right? Great. <laughs> now, um, now, in terms of these, uh, these different terms, you guys, we'll first talk about necrosis. Now, necrosis is an irreversible form of damage that where that's due to harmful exposure to harmful agents or mechanical damage. So necrosis can come about due to loss of blood flow or harm, exposure to harmful agents. And uh, that differs from apoptosis because apoptosis is actually programmed cell death. We talked about earlier how cells can kill themselves, right? Another example of apoptosis I can give you guys right now is where uh, when you're first born, even though you have a little baby brain, there are three times the number of neurons in your baby brain than you do have as an adult. In fact, early on in childhood development, you lose a decent proportion of those neurons, and what you're left with is a smaller number of neurons that are better formed. So we call this pruning where neurons in your brain, after you're born, brain cells, they're basically pruned or clipped. That way your brain forms in a nice, complete, and well-organized manner. Um, and it's believed that this is one of the reasons why we don't have a memory up until a certain age, because our brains are so disorganized as newborns that until we get enough pruning, we can't even form memories. Right? Like you think about you guys' earliest memories, they're probably around age three. You know, there's people who claim to have earlier memories, but it's not clear whether those memories are true or false. You know, people, there's definitely such thing as false memories. People can think they remember something that was either told to them or saw, they saw a picture and they might construct a memory. Um, 